our scripture reading today has been changed from what it says in the bulletin. It's, it's Psalm 97. Psalm 97. So if you'd like to follow along. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt, melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him, all ye gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad. Because of your judgments, O Lord, for you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is shed upon the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back here with you. Um, you do well to mark your Bibles at Psalm 97. We're going to be kind of flipping back and forth there uh, this morning. Uh, but it's good to be back here. Uh, as was said before, I, I recently got a position in Salem, Oregon. I'm really excited about that. Um, if you don't know me, I'd already mentioned this in class, but uh, I did preach a training program in Los Osos with, uh, with Brent Willie. Finished that in October, and I've been studying with, with Rob Redden, and he's been teaching me Hebrew, and I've developed a, a really good friendship with him, and, and so I just really feel blessed to have gotten to know him over the last year and a half, and I look forward to kind of maintaining that relationship over the years. Um, I kind of want to jump into the lesson because I do have a fair amount of material that I want to cover. Uh, I changed what I was going to preach on. There's something that I was just thinking about this morning and uh, just had this sermon in, on my heart, and so I wanted to, to talk about it. And so the title of the sermon this morning is The Lord Reigns, and I'm going to tell you right now that this sermon, we're going to be on a bit of a roller coaster. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to start off feeling somewhat negative, but give me time. Eventually, the conclusion, I promise, it will be uplifting. Um, but The Lord Reigns. Psalm 97, 1. The psalmist says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. It says, Let the many coastlands be glad. In other words, the reign of God is something that the whole world should be rejoicing over. Let me ask, what are some things that cause you to rejoice? Maybe your favorite sports team is doing well. Maybe getting a good grade on a midterm or college finals. Maybe it's the fact that you finally got that promotion at work and you'll, you'll now be making six figures. What causes you to rejoice? Better yet, what keeps you from rejoicing? I think that the church as a whole lately has almost been taking this kind of pessimistic attitude in general. And I think sometimes I'm one of the people who is guilty of contributing to that. I feel I can't have joy in a world that is legislating abortion and is constantly pushing the envelope on that issue. I feel I can't have joy in a world where our leaders from top to bottom are morally corrupt. I feel I can't have joy in a world where it's becoming easier and easier to do bad things. I feel I can't have joy in a world where the people I love, even within the church and even myself at times, are being influenced by an increasingly debased society that we live in. I feel I can't have joy when life isn't going the direction I want it to go or things aren't unfolding in the way that I had planned or expected. And yet the psalmist says, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. I have a few questions to open up our study this morning. Number one, do you believe in God? 
Number two, do you believe that he reigns? And if the answer to that is also yes, are you glad that he reigns? Because the psalmist says the whole earth should rejoice, giving all the more reason for us to rejoice. Because the fact of the matter is this, there are people in our country and in this world that don't simply just choose not to believe in God, but they are trying to scrub his name away and remove his fingerprints and influence from the world that we live in. For example, when I was growing up, I remember in elementary school that, that there was a lot of people protesting the Pledge of Allegiance. And the reason why was because they didn't like the words, one nation under God. I think that there was also a movement to remove the words, and God we trust, off of our money. And most recently, there was an attempt to strike the words, so help you God, for politicians that were being sworn into office. We live in a country that doesn't just choose to not believe in God, but they despise God. We don't want to be one nation subjected under our Lord's reign. We don't want to trust in his ways. We don't want God's help. We just want us and the things we think satisfy us right now. And all those examples that I gave can be looked at as, as small things. We could chalk them up and say, oh, that's no big deal. But the fact is, is that they are indicative of the fact that we are living in a country that is teaching their children that they don't need God. And that is a scary thought. Because in reality, what we realize is that a people without God is a people without joy. If we don't have God, we can't have joy. And what I mean by that when I say joy is I'm talking about a true joy. A joy that endures even through the hardest of circumstances. A joy which grounds us even during the most trying times. It isn't a joy that says we can never have hard times. We know that, that life makes it inevitable, that we're going to be sad at times and we're going to have hard times. But rather, it's a joy that can always look forward and always has hope. When we don't have God, we lose this joy. And while we may have a temporal excitement and happiness as we gratify sometimes the darkest desires that we may have, we know that movement away from God only leads to misery and condemnation. That's a lesson that Solomon had to learn. We think about Solomon, he's the most successful king the richest person, perhaps, in the history of the world. Anything that he wanted to do, he did it. Every desire he had, he fulfilled it. And yet, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1, he reached the conclusion at the end of that book, and he says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure We're warned about this all throughout the Bible. We're warned that our ways, leaning on our own ways, will lead nowhere we want to end up. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We're told that we don't even know what's good for us. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, he says that our hearts are deceitful above all else desperately wicked. Our hearts want things that are simply no good for us. We have these lusts and our heart says, I want that. And we convince ourselves that we need it. We forget about everything that will eventually come as a result of gratifying the flesh in unrighteous ways. And we forget about the collateral damage that our sin will eventually cause. We fail to see how much we don't really want anything to do with sin until it finally leads us to a place that we never wanted to be. An addiction we never wanted. Hurting people we never intended to hurt. Until we hopefully and finally say, if only I could go back. If only I knew what I now know. It's no wonder that Jeremiah says, 
Jeremiah 10, 23 and 24. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. And so what's the very next thing that Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, says? He says, correct me, O oh Lord, in justice. We need the correction of God. I think about Romans 7. In Romans chapter 7, in the latter half of that chapter, we see kind of this tug of war, this internal tug of war that goes on inside of man between trying to do what's right and still doing what's wrong. And we can relate to the man that Paul lays out for us in Romans chapter 7. Because when we're sold under sin, Paul says in verse 15 of Romans chapter 7, he says, I don't understand my own actions. We see what we want to do. Even what we're supposed to do. And yet Paul says, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. In verse 19. And we feel that pull, that tug of war. Because we're spirits designed to live by the Spirit, according to the Spirit. However, for now, on this earth, we're in our earthen vessels, in the flesh. And so we feel that tug of war that goes on inside of all of us as we try to overcome sin and the gross desires of our bodies. But the man that Paul describes there in Romans chapter 7, he first appears to be hopeless, doesn't he? Why? Because that man is trying to direct his own steps. Until he finally realizes what? In Romans chapter 7, he finally realizes that, number one, he's wretched. In verse 24 of Romans chapter 7, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he finally realizes that God is the answer. The answer to his question is, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with the flesh I serve the law of sin. Without God, sooner or later, we realize there is no joy. Because we're wretched without him in our lives to direct us. We're lost, aren't we? We use that term from time to time again about being lost. We understand what that means. Have you ever been lost before? I have. Let me tell you, the longer I was lost, the less hopeful I was. And I certainly wasn't feeling any joy. But do you know what the first step to not being lost anymore is? It's first realizing that we are, in fact, lost, isn't it? The sooner we do that, the better. The sooner we realize we're lost and that we need to turn our lives back over to God, the better. Because there's less damage that way. And that should be obvious. The problem is that there are some who are unwilling to even acknowledge the fact that they are lost. And when that's the case, then we're in worse trouble than what we even realize. Without God, there is no hope. And it's inevitable that we will realize that at one point or another. But let's talk for a moment, take a step back, and look at it from a more national standpoint. Because we understand the turmoil that we'll all eventually go through if, if we try to live our sides individually Without God. But what happens when an entire nation decides to do so? You know, we're not the first nation that has started a movement away from God, are we? Who else did that? Well, we know there's many nations that have done that, but we think about in the Bible, we think first and foremost of Israel. Israel moved away from God, didn't they? Look no further than the book of Judges. We see that the book of Judges picks up right where the book of Joshua left off. And we even see that the death of Joshua is detailed in chapter 2. It's interesting to me because the story of Joshua in that whole book 
is one of the most successful stories that you'll ever read about in the Old Testament. It was a high point in Israel's history. But it only took one generation for things to start taking a dive. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, it says after Joshua's death, there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord. We may think that we have it tough as we're Christians, and, and we're Christians, and we feel like we're in the minority sometimes with our faith, don't we? But remember, Israel was invading a territory that had not known God at all. In fact, not only did they not know God, but they were actively serving false gods, such as Baal and Ashtoreth. And I could bore you with kind of the details of, of what went along with worshiping those, those gods. But I'll just say this of Baal. The form of Baal that they were worshiping at that time was looked at somewhat as this god of fertility. And so they relied upon this false god, this image, to provide for them agriculturally. Uh, they relied upon this false god for animal husbandry. Uh, but finally, they relied upon this false god when it came to human fertility and, of course, sexuality. And with that came all kinds of perversions. Can we relate to one of those problems today in our nation? Human sexuality, right? This is where Israel's moral degradation began as they moved further and further away from God. Is the same thing not happening today in our nation? We look at so many of the messed up things in this world and in particular this country and it seems it all comes back to sexual perversion. This beautiful thing that God has given man and that man has messed up. We think about simple things such as the whole more than two genders phenomenon that's going on. And really what it comes down to, I'll let you in on a secret, it's about sex. And they aren't trying to make a hundred genders, what they're really trying to do is just get rid of two. We ask the question, why? Well, that way you can be with whoever you want. You don't have to feel guilty because you can simply tell yourself that there are no genders or gender doesn't matter or we are, we're all just a different gender anyway, so homosexuality isn't really a thing. Same thing with abortion. We're moving away from valuing the life of the innocent the way that God would want us to. And again, we ask the question, why? And I would suggest that it's because we aim to serve ourselves in this twisted false god of sex rather than the one true God. We're trying to remove the consequences and responsibility of sin in order to do what? Encourage promiscuity, eliminate guilt and shame, or sometimes there should be both. What our nation wants is exactly what Israel had at that time. You know the crux of the whole book of Judges? It really comes down to one statement that is made twice. And it sums up what the entire book of Judges is all about. First time we find it is in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. Where it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And then we find it again, it's how the book closes in the last chapter. And you talk about national degradation and moral corruption. Read the things that transpire between chapters 17 and 21 of the book of Judges, particularly chapter 19. And there are things that transpire there that I'm not even comfortable talking about from the pulpit. I think it would be inappropriate to do so. But Israel became a place of perversion and justice and bloodshed. Doing what they wanted to do did not bring the pleasure or joy that they thought it would 
Instead, it led to spiritual destitution and brother rising up against brother and families being split apart. There was no rejoicing at the end of Judges. Why? Because there is no king in Israel and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, God handed them over to themselves because that's what they wanted. And it didn't bring any joy, just death and judgment. Really, you look at the book of Judges and it's kind of a perfect example of Romans chapter 1 and we see this this process that takes place in Romans chapter 1, 18 through 30, where Paul's kind of going through this, this degradation process that can take place with man. And you turn over to Romans chapter 1, and he starts off by talking about, in verse 18, how the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. He goes on to say in verse 21, Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. But then in verse 24, he says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up, to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their, for their error. And since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. God handed Israel over. We see that throughout the book of Judges. He handed them over to their enemies. And we see this, this cyclical process in the book of Judges. That's what it's all about. They, they abandon God, and then they go into captivity. And so he hands them over to the Philistines, to the Ammonites, the Midianites, the Amalekites. But then the moral depravity really comes to a climax again in Judges chapter 19. And finally, who does God hand them over to? hands them over to themselves. Just like what we just read in Romans chapter 1. I think we can make the case that the wrath of God was certainly revealed to Israel all throughout the book of Judges. But there is no greater wrath that God can reveal to us, no greater punishment than the wrath of abandonment. The wrath of the wrath of letting us do what we want to do. Letting us do what we think is right in our own eyes. That's when the wrath of God is truly revealed to us. So you may be sitting in your pew and, and saying, well, before I wasn't feeling pessimistic, but now I am. <laughs> and you may be asking yourself, where's the hope? Or maybe you, you felt that there was no hope already. And I just solidified your thoughts for you. By the way, that's not my intention. Because the book of Judges is about so much more than moral degradation and the hopeless man, hopelessness of man when left to his own devices. The book of Judges is also about God's long-suffering and willingness to give us grace and his ability to deliver. I think that this thought and idea is echoed in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. In 2 Peter chapter uh, 3 and verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is long-suffering towards us. But we see the people of Israel do the same thing over and over again. In the book of Judges. And they serve false gods. God hands them over to their enemy. And they cry out to God. God saves them. Rinse and repeat. That's what you see throughout the book of Judges. Because of his long suffering. He would gracefully forgive them. And take pity on them. And then he would provide deliverance for them. By raising up a judge. So what does this have to do. 
with rejoicing over the reign of the Lord. Go back to our psalm, Psalm 97, which gives us the, the theme of the lesson here this, this morning. Let's continue reading in verse 2. Psalm 97, and we'll pick up in verse 2 after he says, The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. In verse 2 he says, Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame, who make their boasts in worthless idols, and worship him, or worship him, all you gods. We see this dichotomy in these verses, right? Because the reign of God should lead everyone to rejoice. And it's easy to see why. Because we see that he is long-suffering and merciful even towards those who, pervert, who are perverse and break, repeatedly break the covenant that he's made with them. If they just simply repent and call upon him. But when people don't value his reign, when they don't acknowledge his reign, his commandments, his judgments, it creates shame, doesn't it? Read verse 7 again. It says, All worshipers of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. When we become stubborn in our immorality and false ways, we see God only as this convicting intimidator, don't we? A God that melts the mountains like wax. And we don't see him as the Savior that he is. And so his reign puts us to shame because we're guilty before him. The psalmist says, let the earth rejoice. It doesn't mean that everyone will, it just means that everyone should. We see the messed up circumstances during the days of Isaiah when he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, in Isaiah 5.4 call evil good and good evil. We see that today, don't we? Why on earth does this sort of thing happen today? It's simple. Doing evil and living in darkness is something that brings guilt and shame upon everyone. And so what do people do? They flip the script and they say, we're light and you're dark. And it removes shame. They say, we are right, and God is wrong. Or better yet, they say, we are God. We determine for ourselves what is right, and what is true, and what is good. When we do that, we can do whatever we want, can't we? Nothing is off limits. Nobody is safe, not even newborn babies. So we rejoice at the reign of God because we see what props the thrones of this world. Money, power, corruption, greed, self-glorification, wickedness, perversity. And then we see God's throne. And we see what the psalmist says props up God's throne. In verse 2 it says righteousness and justice are the foundations, the pillars of of his throne. I did some research, and you know how many babies have been aborted from the year 1970 to 2015? 45 million. 45 million. And we look at that, and we're thankful that we have a God, and we think about things that David said, the things David said after he lost his baby. <laughs> 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. He, he'd been mourning, he'd been fasting. And then his servants come in and they tell him, your baby died. And then he cleans himself up, he stops fasting, he eats something, he stops mourning. And they're dumbfounded by this. They say, what's the deal? And he says, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? He says, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. We rejoice at the reign of God, knowing that there are 
45 million babies that are safe in the arm of God. And that at the end of the day, we'll do the right thing. We rejoice knowing that this is the one who reigns. The one who will show unbelievable amounts of mercy and grace towards those who rejoice at his reign. But serves justice towards his adversaries and continually choose to rebel and oppress the truth in favor of wickedness and lies. Without God, there is no hope. But we understand that hope ultimately does lie in submission to God. We ask the question, where is the hope? Hope lies in submission to God. We go back to the psalm, that's the text this morning. And in verse 8, it says, Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. The psalmist makes it clear who is glad? Who rejoices at the reign of God? It's, it's Judah. That's what he says. But why are they glad? Because they hear God. Shema. That's the Hebrew word. And it's this idea of more than just listening to what he says, but obeying what he says. In other words, they're obedient and subject themselves to him. And because of that, they do not fear his judgments, but rather they rejoice at them. Because the Lord is on their side to deliver them from the hands of the wicked and preserve their lives. You continue reading that psalm in verse 9. It says, For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. And in verse 10, he says, O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. They know that no matter how bad life gets, God will ultimately deliver them. We have the same hope. In fact, if you go back to Romans 1 that describes that degradation process that takes place when man abandons God. What is the context that it, that is mentioned in? What is he talking about just before he goes into detail about those things? He's talking about the gospel, isn't he? He's talking about the gospel of Christ and how it's God's power to save. And it saves us how? It saves us by making us righteous. And it's this power that induces man to live by faith in God because faith in God is how we will live. He says, the just shall live by faith. You know, he's quoting Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 when he says that. And if you read the first half of that verse, Paul doesn't quote it because it's a stark contrast. It doesn't fit the context of what Paul is talking about. But Habakkuk says in the first half of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright with them, but the righteous shall live by faith. When Habakkuk is talking about a man and his soul not being upright within him, what he's really saying is he's saying that he's dead. If your soul isn't upright within you, then you're dead. And why is he dead? Because he's puffed up. He's prideful. He prefers his own ways. He directs his own steps. So his soul is not upright within himself. And one day that will be made clear. But the righteous live by their faithfulness to God. And that, that's as true then as it is now. So it's easy to be pessimistic about this world. But scripture acknowledges the fact that this world is a world of darkness. It does acknowledge that. Those are the inspired words of the Holy Spirit. I want us to go back and we're going to read Psalm 97 and just read verses 11 and 12. And I'll start in verse 11. He says, Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. And now with that in mind, I want us to flip over to Colossians chapter 1. That's going to be our last scripture this morning with this. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 says, 
Paul says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of saints and light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The psalmist says that light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. And that is just as true then as it is now as through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've been transferred from this world of darkness, this world of corruption, into the kingdom of his beloved son, where God reigns, and his reign is propped up by righteousness and justice. So if you're here this morning, and you're tired of all the corruption that's in the world, and you want to submit yourself to a righteous and just a rain that will reward you. A rain that will cause you to rejoice. If that's something that you want to do this morning, then you can do that by submitting, obeying his gospel, and by being baptized into Christ. If you have any spiritual need whatsoever, please come forward while we stand and sing the song of invitation.